Good morning. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Amen? Right? The title of our message today is Jesus, the Merciful Savior. And you and I, we need mercy from God, right? Uh, We need mercy. If God doesn't give us mercy, what will come of us? Uh, we'll be in a heap of trouble. Right? We'll, be, we'll have all sorts of problems, but ultimately, uh, like Absalom in Sunday school, we'll be under a heap of boulders. Right? Uh, we'll be in all sorts of trouble. Uh, we don't need uh, justice from God, because right? we have nothing to offer Him. Um, we don't need what we deserve, because we deserve wrath, but we need what we don't deserve, uh, which is mercy. If you have your Bible, uh, turn to Mark um, chapter 10. Uh, We are continuing uh, this morning our exposition of the gospel of Mark, and we'll be at the last um, seven verses uh, there in Mark 10. Mark 10, 46 through 52. And if you're able, uh, would you stand uh, for the reading of this text today? Mark 10, 46. It says, And they came to Jericho, And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. In verse 49, And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they, that's the crowd, the the twelve, those who are with him, they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? That's a wild question. Could imagine Jesus asking you this. And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately, He recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is the way of the Lord. You can be seated. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come before you. I'm asking that you'd give us humble hearts, that you'd um, help us to bow before you in submission uh, to your word. Uh, we praise you for your holiness, your righteousness, uh, your glory, all that, all that you've revealed about yourself in your word, God. And we praise you for your mercy. Uh, we praise you that you've sent your Son into the world and that he came and he's fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law and he calls us to him. God, be with us now. Uh, Do what only you can do. Open our eyes, open our ears and hearts uh, to hear your word and be changed in light of it. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Near the cross, um, I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting, ever, till I... Know the words? We sing it all the time. Till I reach the what? 
the golden strand uh, just beyond the river. We sang that song a moment ago, and as Cody mentioned, uh, that was written by uh, Fanny Crosby. We sing a lot of songs uh, that she wrote uh, as hymns here, and uh, that's pretty easy to do because she was a prolific hymn writer. Um, she was a granddaughter of Puritans. Um, she's said uh, to have written more than 8,000 hymns and gospel songs. 8,000. Uh, with more than 100 million copies printed of her works. Uh, she lived in the 1800s and early 1900s. She was known as the queen of gospel songwriters. Fun fact. Um, she was also the first woman to speak before the Senate. I didn't know that until I was preparing for this. It happened in 1843. And so she is known for her beautiful gift of, of poetry and art and songwriting, how she's able uh, to put into writing what we long to see, right? She's so gifted at this, and her whole life uh, was blind. Some people say she was born blind. Others say that she had a condition at just six weeks old that brought on blindness. Ne never sing. You know, that brings a whole new light to watching and waiting, uh, looking above, also written by Fanny Crosby, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. She was blind. And you know, there's, there are a few things in life, there are many sad things in life, right? But there are a few things that are way sadder to me than this issue of being blind. You know, one who is blind, they, they cannot see the glory of God around them in His creation. Um, they can't see the beauty of the world. They can't see that. They can't. More than that, uh, most people that are blind are incredibly restricted in what they can do, right? Because you need somebody uh, to help you. you. You are pretty much totally at the mercy of someone who's willing to assist you. In the ancient world, uh, there may be nothing more debilitating than being blind. Um, amidst all of our problems in our modern society, you know, there are some probably wicked, but programs that exist that help people, you know, today, but that, that wasn't the case then. Um, in the ancient world, especially in the first century, someone who was blind, they would be forced into this life of begging, begging for alms, uh, maybe sitting by the side of the road uh, like Bartimaeus, or sometimes living uh, in a cul-de-sac somewhere by themselves uh, with, with their hands open, uh, hoping that someone would have compassion in their heart and give to them. And... We, we would hope that they had a better picture than we often do of people on the sides of the road, right? We're, we're often skeptical of those who are begging sometimes. But in this case, there was no other way. Um, and considering that, there may be no other person in the New Testament who knew what it meant to truly say, in my hands, no price I bring, simply to the cross I cling, than Bartimaeus, who had nothing. Had nothing. And, and he suffered many disadvantages. But he understood that, right? He, he understood that he needed Christ. He needed God to give him what he needed. And that's all he could do. That's all he could do. So... From the very beginning, um, this picture of his physical blindness, don't miss this if you hear nothing else. This is but a picture of our spiritual blindness. Uh, we, we had nothing to offer Jesus, right? This, this physical blindness of Bartimaeus is a picture of the spiritual blindness of the world. So don't be so blind as to not see yourself in the text. Because we're there in Bartimaeus. Um, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And in all of this scene, 
we are pointed to this. It, it took the miracle of the new birth for us to see, right? We needed something done for us so that we could have our eyes opened to see our need. And you and I, regardless of the condition of our eyes, uh, we are dependent 100% on the mercy of God every day. Every day we are. And so we can look at this text, hopefully be reminded of the humility we must have uh, to come before the Lord, recognizing our need for Him, recognizing that we've got nothing to give Him. The only thing we brought to Him was the sin that made His death necessary, right? Everything we do should be this, this prayer of Bartimaeus, this cry out. It should reverberate through what we do. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. That should be the, the cry of our own life. Well, as far as an outline goes, we're just going to walk through the passage, but I am going to give us just four major headings to make note of as we look through these verses. And as we seek to learn uh, from this encounter between the Lord Jesus and blind Bartimaeus. So the first heading I'll give us is, notice uh, these travelers. Look there in verse 46. Uh, these travelers, and they came to Jericho. And contrary to popular belief and the pronoun chaos of our day, this is not one person. Right? This is a group of people, right? And, and that's how language should be used. And so who makes up the they? You look there in verse 46. Uh, first of all, the Lord Jesus. And so what is He doing? Uh, for the last several chapters of Mark, we see Jesus as journeying to Jerusalem. Uh, he's on His way there. And what will happen there? He will die, right? He's, he's got His face set uh, for Jerusalem. And he's going there. Nothing is going to stop that from happening. We also see the twelve are there. Uh, they're mentioned later there in verse 46. And then we see a large crowd. Um, that's a good description. We have no idea how large, but to be honest, it, it could be as large as we could imagine because what's happening? The Passover celebration is coming. And so this would be in a common walking direction for people after all, Jesus has been doing all these miracles. He's been doing all these things, and people are hearing about it. And um, there could be there could be a thousand people walking through here. It's it's unknown. It's estimated that during the Passover there'll be over a hundred thousand people in Jerusalem uh, to celebrate this. So it's a big group, and they're going there um, to celebrate the Passover. And what's interesting, not knowing that the true Passover lamb is with them, right? walking in front, uh, leading them uh, in triumphal procession, you could say, um, to the cross. So there's this travel party. This is the, this is the scene. This is a, a big, chaotic, wild scene here, most likely. And if you look there in verse 46, it, it's worded kind of funny. And I just want to briefly mention this. It says, And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho, well, okay, so what's the, what's the point of this? Um, and if, if you just looked at um, the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, if you went and looked in Matthew 20, and you looked in Luke, Luke something, Luke 18, um, you'll see that they all kind of phrase, phrase this differently. And so you could think by looking... And the, there's some sort of contradiction here. Uh, for example, in Luke 18, it says, As they drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road. But Mark here tells us, As they were leaving Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road. And in Matthew 20, says that as well. As they went out of Jericho, behold, there were two blind men. That's in Matthew 20, uh, 29 and 30. Um, but I think... Well, number one, there's no contradiction in God's Word. Um, if we see one, the contradiction's in us. Amen? Uh, we're the problem. But actually, I think that the reason for this statement is that it's geographical. Um, there are actually two Jerichos. So we all know about the first one. 
right? We, we know about the one in Joshua where the people of Israel marched around and they, they took it over in a glorious fashion, right? We could say the least. Um, we all know about that um, in the Old Testament. Uh, but by this time, uh, that city is dust and rubble, okay? But sometime after that, uh, much closer to this timeline, King Herod built a new city uh, nearby, and he called it Jericho. And, and it was at the base, basin there of the mountains, and it was a palace-filled city, like a, almost like Herod's resort town he would go to in the winter. The climate was better, uh, full of palm trees and rich trade and nice things. And, and that's the other Jericho to the east of the old Jericho, this rich and flourishing area. So maybe the reason Mark says it that way is, well, there's two Jerichos. They're going to Jericho, and then they're going to Jericho also, um, because they would have had to pass through the rubble of the old to get up to Jerusalem. Um, So there's another fun fact of the day. There's two of those. You may get five or six more. We'll see. But this is a rich flourishing area, this New Testament Jericho, we'll call it. Some historical resources will even refer to it as the Herodian Jericho, if you wanted to research that. But they're traveling, they they come to this city that's known for its aesthetics. It's known for its beauty. It's known for the wealthy to travel there and for the wealthy to have pleasure there. And just a quick application before we move on to the next heading there in the text, but as Jesus comes to this city, as we've noted for several weeks, his mind is not distracted by the aesthetics of Jericho. His mind and attention does not go uh, to this beautiful city, to this luxurious area. None of those things. For what's his mind on? It is fixed on the mission that God has called him to. Uh, Earlier in Mark, every time it describes them walking, it always says Jesus is way ahead of them. It's like he's, he's keeping a quicker pace because his mind is set on obeying the Lord, right? His mind is fixed on what God has called him to. And there's something for us here. How often are we distracted by the aesthetics? We are, right? In our day and age, there are tons of things that distract us from what it is that God has called us to. And Jesus here, he demonstrates for us an example of the virtue that it is to know what God's called you to, and then to do it. And we may have questions, right? I don't know what God wants me to do. I'm only 33 years old. I don't know. I'm still young, right? I'm kidding. But but we don't know every detail. But we have a book full of details. Amen? We have, we have lots of callings and instructions for us. And Jesus gives us a clear example. We need to be determined. We need to have urgency. We need to be disciplined with what it is that God's called us to do. Like Jesus. Not to be distracted. Not to be uh, dismayed, slowed down. Not to be so easily moved from the assignments that the Lord has given us. Like Brian talked about on Wednesday night. Um, We need to have our attention set on God's Word. Right? The question is, what do we want more? We often want to do everything else, right? Rather than be diligent in God's Word. And that's to our own uh, failure. But that's convicting to consider. Nothing will deter Jesus from accomplishing the mission God's called Him to. And anything will deter us. Anything. Let that not be the case. So first we have these travelers, this traveling party. Second, uh, note here, uh, Bartimaeus, uh, the blind beggar. Look there in verse 46 again. And notice how in the middle of the verse, the attention shifts uh, and zeroes in 
focuses in, the lens is fixed on this blind beggar named Bartimaeus. By the way, he's the only blind man healed in the New Testament whose name's given. Not certain if there's relevance to that, but fun, fun note number three. Um, Bartimaeus. And it's also helpful to consider, it's very unlikely that he's the only beggar there that day. Um, I actually mentioned the text in Matthew where it says there were two beggars. Uh, Mark decides this is the one that he's going to give attention to in the providence of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. And, And to be honest, this is prime real estate for a beggar. As I mentioned earlier, this is a main road heading to Jerusalem. What did I mention earlier also? The Passover feast is coming. Thousands of people are going to go down this road. Um, if you're a blind beggar and you're, you're, all your hope is in numbers, right? I hope, you know, one out of these hundred people will help me. This is where you'd want to be. This is prime real estate. And he's there as people are going uh, to celebrate the Passover, which we remember, um, where God broke the yoke of Egyptian slavery. He sent the plagues. Um, The last and final plague, the death angel goes through the camp and anybody who hadn't slain a lamb, any head of the house that didn't slay the lamb and put the blood on the doorposts, the angel came in to that house, right, and killed the firstborn son. And so they're they're remembering this because those who did obey God and listened and, and put the blood on the post, he passed over them. And so they're remembering this God pulling back his judgment on them, God extending his grace, and they celebrate this every year. So this is a big deal. This, this celebration is a big deal. And this picture, of course, is about the Lord Jesus, right, who also shed his blood on wooden posts and died for us. And verse 46 says, As he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting there by the roadside. So again, you can picture it. There's this large crowd. There's all this noise. Um, Jesus of Nazareth is coming through the town. There's all this going on that you can imagine. And we have Bartimaeus, like we mentioned, here's a blind man. He has no means of helping himself to anything. He has nothing. He's on the side of the road in hopes that someone will have some compassion on him and would be give him alms to help him. In verse 47, look there, it says, When he, Bartimaeus, heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. And so there's no doubt that there was a lot of noise. There's no doubt this was drawing a lot of attention. Um, after all, Everyone have heard of Jesus the Nazarene, right? He's been uh, doing all these miracles. He's been amazing all these people. Um, He's raised the dead. He's healed the leopard. He's healed a paralyzed man and even the blind. Bartimaeus, no doubt, has heard of this. He's heard of Jesus. Furthermore, Bartimaeus may have heard someone read Isaiah 35 that we read earlier in the temple. He, he may be thinking, could this be the one who is coming? He's already done this. He's already healed these people. He can even heal the blind. And Bartimaeus has heard of this, and Jesus is coming by the road. And you could imagine, if you put yourself into Bartimaeus' position, he might be thinking, This might be the only time this ever happens to me, right? This this could be my chance. I've been begging by the side of the road for my whole life. And now there's one who comes who can heal the blind. Maybe for Bartimaeus, he's thinking, this is probably a moment in my life that will not be replicated ever again. By the way, it wasn't, right? Jesus would never come back this road, right? This is his chance. 
This, this may be my only opportunity. It's now or never, right? How we might say this. This, this, is, my, this is all I've got. And, and this desperation is sinking in here into his mind. He must take advantage. And you know what? Who cares what anybody else thinks? I've been laying here begging forever. I don't care about the crowd. I don't care what I look like. I don't care what anybody says. This is it. This is it. I am blind and I need my sight. I am a sinner and I need a Savior. And so he can't hold it back. In verse 47, he begins to cry out. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, Son of David. Now, if you've been in Sunday school, we think about this a lot. right? The last several weeks, um, how David... Um, was promised that through his seed there would be a much greater son of David, one who would come who would fulfill all the messianic role, one who would come who is king forever and whose throne will never end. And who's that? Jesus. Very good. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Cody. Nobody else is listening. Um, but yes, yeah, son of David, this is the first time in the Gospel of Mark that this title is used of Jesus. Now, there may be substantial significance to that. There may be none. I'm going to lean on the other side because this would be a unique title to ascribe to Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, Who, Why? This is his messianic title. Right? In... 2 Samuel 7, which we were in just a few weeks ago. In Psalm 89, we see this Davidic covenant. The one who would come, the greater son of David, who would fulfill all the promises that God had made to David. And this blind man on the side of the road yells this. Now, he could just be crafty, thinking, that'll get Jesus' attention. I doubt it. I doubt it. Maybe that although he was blind, he could see what the crowd didn't see. Maybe although he was blind, surely God was already working in his heart. Right? Surely the, his senses, you know, you, you hear that when someone's one sense is failing them, maybe the other ones work more. Right? Maybe his mind is really sharp. Maybe he can picture the scrolls being read, and he knows, he's heard these things. He maybe sees more than John the Baptist saw. You remember John the Baptist in a moment of weakness sends his disciples to Jesus and says, are you, the, are you the Christ or not? Maybe Bartimaeus was confident. He already knew that. Surely God was working on his heart, making it clear. This is the Messiah. This is the one whom will be entrusted with supreme authority. And that authority goes beyond just the Jews in Jerusalem. Amen? It's, it's over the whole planet. It's over the universe. Right? It's over the animal kingdom, as we'll see next week. It's over even physical infirmities. Right? Son of David, have mercy on me. Have pity and compassion on me. Have tender heartedness towards me. What's he asking for? He's asking for grace, right? Give me grace. Don't give me what I deserve. Don't give me justice. Don't give me what belongs to me. Don't give me a better seat here. Or like the disciples, don't let me sit at your right hand and your left hand. Just give me grace. Just give me grace. This is a statement of confidence 
Bartimaeus recognizes here, if Jesus would just give me mercy, I would be changed. He can do it. He has confidence in Jesus. He, he recognizes his need and his misery. He recognizes this. We need to recognize this. We need to be like Bartimaeus because it's true of us, right? It's true. Look at verse 48. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. This is a harsh rebuke. It's as if they were saying, he doesn't have time for you. We've got a good thing going here. Don't you know where we're going? We're going to take the throne in Jerusalem. The king is marching in. He don't have time for you. A side note here, these must have been the worst evangelists in the world. The only ones worse than them is us, right? Because we are. But that's a different sermon. These are the worst evangelists ever. This man is calling for the Lord whom they have, and they say, leave me alone. Get out of here. Now let me ask you this. Do you think that the church today does that? You better believe it. Does the church ever stand in the way of someone coming to Christ in our day and age? Absolutely. And that's a, that's a sad reality. But unfortunately, we are like the crowd. You know, we say this a lot, trying to make ourselves the hero. We're like Bartimaeus. We need to be, but we're like the crowd. We, we are often afraid. If I, if I invite this person to church, I'll have to sit with them. I'll have to talk to them. I don't want to do that. I'd rather talk about this or talk about that. May that not be so of us. We need to be better evangelists than these men. And, and, and we can have hope. God can change that. After all, what will these men do? They'll turn the world upside down. Just a matter of months. So God can change us, and we, we should pray for that. God, make us good evangelists. God, change my heart. Don't take away my selfishness. Stop, stop me from thinking that church is about me. Stop me from doing that. Let me not be like the crowd. It's just hard to speak against the crowd, right? We can be honest. Crowds are dangerous. Uh, crowds cause problems sometimes. And... You know, you've seen the videos of the people feeling the peer pressure, you know, like all the guys in the elevator, and everybody turns but one. And then the one's like, turns, you know. Crowds do that to us. Crowds put an impression on us, and this is a bad crowd here. But he didn't listen to him. Look at verse 48. But he cried out all the more. And we need to be like this. We need to be resilient in our crying out to the Lord. We don't need to worry about the crowd. We don't need to worry about what people might think of us. We don't need to care what people say to us. We need Jesus. We need His mercy. We need to be like Bartimaeus. But you won't do it. You won't do it until you recognize your need. We need to recognize that. And, and this is just like what Jesus says to us in Matthew 7. Um, Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. In verse 11, If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? God wants to give us good things. He's a good father, right? He wants to give us mercy and grace. Every one of us needs to be in this position. 
We need to not be too proud to beg. Amen? I love what uh, Dr. Stephen Lawson said about this passage. He says, if you don't need, see your need for mercy, you're blinder than Bartimaeus. He's right. He is absolutely right. We must recognize this. We must be willing to lift up our voices higher than the crowd, right? We need to see His power, see His mercy. So do you recognize your need for Christ today? Do you recognize it? Blind Bartimaeus. Our third note, our third heading here in the text. Uh, number three, we, we see the merciful Savior. Jesus is a merciful Savior. Praise God today that we have a merciful Savior. Praise God that we have a Savior who listens. Do you believe that? He listens to us. He hears us. Uh, amidst the crowd, am, amidst the chaos, amidst everything going on, He hears the one who cries out for mercy. He hears that. He cares for us. These are powerful words here in verse 49. When you actually zoom out and you think about what's going on, you think about the amount of people probably screaming and yelling, probably from, for the last hundred miles, and Jesus stops. He, he's out ahead of the crowd. He is walking with this brisk pace. And he hears Bartimaeus and stops. In the middle of this journey, I just consider, with, with, with the weight of the universe on his shoulders, with the judgment of God that was supposed to be poured out on you and me, Right in his mind. With, with all of these things that could be going on. With, how about this? How about the business of holding the universe together? Don't forget about that. He is God. Amen? He's, he's upholding the universe by the word of his power. And even so, he is mindful of sinners who call to him. What is man that you are mindful of him? He comes to a standstill. It's like there's nothing else going on in the world when everything is going on in the world, right? And he gives his attention to this man. And it's the same for you and me. It's not that we're the center of the story. We ain't, right? It's not that we're more important than anybody else. But God cares for His people. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven, interceding for you and me. Right now. In this moment. And, and it's as if when, when we cry out to Him in faith, according to His will, it's as if Jesus stops everything and hears us. It's like that. Now, it ain't like that, because he hears everybody and everything and all the other things and all the complexities of that, but he's, he's divine. He can do that, no problem. He can hear you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxieties on him, because he what? He cares for you. He cares for you and me. 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence that we have towards Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. He hears us. Jesus stops and says, call Him. In verse 49, what a rebuke to the crowd. I mean, you, you picture it. Be quiet. He doesn't have time for you. We're, we're going to Jerusalem. We're going to be kings. I'm going to sit at his right hand. And... 
like I was saying, Jesus says, come here. You know, we've been telling you to come to him. What, what a rebuke. What a rebuke. And, and Jesus tells them to call him, and they called him, and he gets up. He says, take heart, verse 49. Get up. He is calling you. He, he notices you. He, he's looked your way. He's telling you to come to Him. He's calling for you. He's not calling for the crowd, right? He's not calling for every blind man over there. He's calling for you. He's, this, this call was not for every beggar that day. It was for the one who called out to Christ, asking for mercy. That's the one He hears. And so we should be encouraged by that, right? We should be encouraged that in the middle of the complex, really high realities of Jesus ordering the universe, holding all things together, governing the affairs of all the men in the world, he cares for you. He hears you. When we call out to Him, He's able in His infinite deity to turn His ear to you and me. Amen? He can. He can. He's not too busy for us. He's not too on schedule. He cares for you. In verse 50, Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. His, his eyes don't work, but his ears do and his legs do, right? He, he gets up, he, he throws off his cloak. He didn't strip, okay? Um, th this is likely a cloak he had scattered on the ground where people could throw money in to help him, if you can imagine that. So, so in my mind, I just picture dust. Flying into the air, you know. Coins in every direction. Money going flying. Nothing is going to stand in his way. He throws aside everything in, his, in between him and Jesus. He, he gets rid of it all. No hesitation. Nothing will stand in his way. He's coming. The, the master has called him and he is coming to him. You may, you may recognize that in your own life. You, you may remember, uh, if you're a believer here today, when the Spirit pricked your conscience and God made you aware of your need for Christ. There might have been nothing that could stop you from calling on Him, right? Nothing. No hesitation. And we mentioned this earlier. What a question Jesus asks what do you want me to do for you? Man. So representative of Christ's heart for us. He is ready and willing to help this blind man. He's not stopping everybody so that he can make a theological point. He's not stopping everybody to make some argument or point out something. He stops everything to help this man. To come to his aid. And Jesus, he asks the same question today of you. What do you want me to do for you today? What do you need? What do you need from the Lord? What do you need Him to do? Maybe you need salvation. That's number one, right? Maybe you need forgiveness of sins. Then ask Him. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Open up my heart and mind. Give me salvation. Maybe you need guidance. Then pray. Ask Him for clarity to give it to you. Maybe you need encouragement. Lots of us need encouragement. Maybe you're discouraged. 
Ask him for encouragement. God, lift my spirits. God, help me. Maybe you're confused. Ask him to show you what you should do. Maybe you want him to use you in ministry. Lord, use me for your glory. Show me how to serve your kingdom. What do you want me to do for you today? Jesus hears the individual voices of us when we call on him in faith. He hears us. He does not hear the one who calls out in pride. Right? He does not hear the one who says, Give me what I deserve. Give me what I'm owed. What did I do to deserve this? Help me out of this situation. He doesn't hear that person. He hears the one who cries out in mercy. Lord, help me. Lord, I need you. I need you to change this situation. Son of David, have mercy on me. So for us, what about you? What do you need to call out to the Savior? What do you need to say to Him? Do you you understand that you need more than visual sight, right? You need spiritual sight. I don't just need my eyes fixed. I need new eyes. I need eyes that see God's truth. I need eyes that see the gospel. He's ready and willing to receive any sinner. He's the merciful Savior. And we see that clearly here with Bartimaeus. Our last point I'll note here as we move towards the conclusion. Uh, The fourth thing to note here is that the call of Christ is an effectual call. When Jesus calls Bartimaeus to him, what a dramatic change happens. And you know, Bartimaeus, he's probably thinking, well, he's calling to me because I called to him. But that's not right. He called to him because Jesus was already calling him. We're not going to get into all that today, but it's true. God, through the Spirit, was working on him. It, It was God's Spirit that made Bartimaeus able to see that this is the Son of David. It was God that did this. But if Jesus calls you to Him in this way, He will change your whole life. Now, He may not fix your circumstances. He may not fix your body. He may not give you better sight. But He'll give you true sight. He'll give you faith. You know, and there's a call. There's a general call to all men. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe. There's that general call that goes out, but there's an effectual call when Christ comes into your heart and He changes you. When He opens your eyes like Bartimaeus so that you can see His grace. When this happens, you will be changed. Verse 51, the blind man said, Rabbi, literally teacher, But there's more to this. This is a title of honor. Uh, The other Gospels will say Master. Master, Prince. He's coming to Jesus. He's asking to get His sight, but He's coming to Him in submission. That Jesus is Lord. (laughs) He's not coming telling Him how to do it. He's not coming telling Him what He needs. What He wants, I mean. He's he's coming telling Him in submission. He's not coming and saying, this is the way it's got to be. He's not saying, I'd have a lot of help if you just give me some eyes. No, he comes in submission to the Lord. And this is the right way to come, by the way. In submission. Uh, This this request here, in in some senses, is a confession of faith. It's a confession that Jesus, as the Son of David, as the Messiah, He has infinite ability to change my situation. He has confidence. He he has faith that Jesus, if He would just give me mercy, He would change me. He would make me whole. He has authority. He puts this faith on Him. And Jesus changes Him. 
Jesus said to him, Go your way, verse 52, Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. You know, the answer is in the first word. Go. And why is that? He can't go. He's not gone anywhere for his whole life. He's on the side of the road begging. He can't do anything. He can barely scrounge up enough to eat. He's got to have somebody else help him. But everything is different now. Because Jesus has called him. And everything's different. He's, he's a totally different person. And so is it really that simple? Could it possibly be that simple today? That if simply by faith we ask Jesus for what we need, that Christ is able to simply open the treasury of heaven and give us grace. It is. It is because He's Lord, right? He, he is Lord, and this is what grace is. This favor is not deserved. This healing is not deserved. It's grace. It's undeserved. It's undeserved. And this physical miracle is simply a picture of the far greater spiritual miracle that Christ has done in each of us or needs to do in you today. All the miracles are, to be honest. They're a picture of what Christ would do in His people. This man's eyes are made new. But more important than that is the need of every man for their heart to be made new. Right? This man has come out of physical darkness. As a blind person, he was in a prison of night. And now he can see. But far greater than that, we need to be delivered from spiritual darkness. Far greater, far more important. In closing, I'll leave us with this. At one level, of course, this is a story about a blind man who needs his sight and gets it. That is true. But there's a much larger narrative here, right? Jesus is going to Jerusalem and He is going there with His eyes fixed on the road in a hurry to go to Jerusalem. And what will happen in Jerusalem? He will go there. He'll proclaim judgment. He'll preach and teach. And He'll be betrayed and then crucified on behalf of sinners like us. And in that crucifixion, and in that subsequent resurrection and ascension, He has rescued everyone who believes upon Him from spiritual blindness. The greater miracle. And these signs in the text, don't forget, these signs in the Gospels, these are signs for you, right? We come at this often as just any other book. We come at this as just a book of history. These are testimonies to you that you are accountable for and I'm accountable for. These are truths that I'm going to have to answer for, what I did with them, right? These testimonies are the truth that Jesus is, in fact, who He said He was. And Bartimaeus knows this and calls upon Him. And Jesus never went this way again. He never went back. This was it. Now, God's sovereign and He's working all this out and there was no way this wasn't going to happen and all blah, 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 blah. That's all true and we testify and praise God for that. But He never went back. You could answer the question, had Bartimaeus been a coward and listened to the crowd, he'd be in hell today. Without God's mercy, and God could have done anything, but that's worth considering. Jesus may have passed by him and he would be without his mercy. 
So what will you do? It may very well be today that in the preaching of God's word, in the singing of hymns, in the public prayers, that Jesus is passing by you. He may never go this way again. There's a true reality, right? We don't know what tomorrow brings. I'm sure we've all got plans with family, but we may never see tomorrow. We have no idea what's going to happen. And if in your heart and mind you've cried out to Him, Lord, I am lost. I am blind and I need mercy. He hears that. Son of David, don't pass me by. I'm not good enough. I need your works in my place. I need your blood to cleanse me. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Right? Pass me not, O gentle and merciful Savior. Put your trust in Him today. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come before You and we pray that in the power of Your Spirit, You would bring to full mind in all of us the right um, recognition, the right realization, the right understanding that we are but blind beggars apart from your mercy. We have nothing. We have nothing. And God, this morning, there's no doubt, uh, many believers in here and some unbelievers And Lord, we pray that Your Spirit will work in all of us. We would be reminded of our need for mercy. We would recognize our humble estate. We would be changed. We would not be too proud to beg. We we would call upon You, begging You for mercy, asking You for the things that we need because You care for us. And that is amazing and mind Blowing that that's true, but it is because your scripture affirms it. God, if there's some here that don't know you, we pray that they would hear your gospel and what we've said this morning. That they would find their hope and their rest and their mercy in your son's death and resurrection. God, be with us now. Don't let us be like the crowd, Lord. Let us be evangelists. Let us be those who call out and tell others. And when we hear those calling out, we don't tell them to be quiet, but we tell them to come to You. God, help us now. Pray that Your Word would be in our hearts and in our minds, and we would go away more conformed into Christ's image. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Have a blessed day. God bless you.